bringing the insight, the information, the observation, all of it into one perfectly built film. Here's the trailer for it, and then Jeffrey M. Smith. They take genes from one species and force it into the DNA of other species. We have hundreds of millions of acres of genetically modified crops that have been planted in the United States, and yet most people are not aware. I found out that our food supply is genetically modified, and guess what? The food that my son ate on August 25th, 2009 was raw corn, the corn that almost killed him. The process of insertion plus cloning creates massive collateral damage. There can be hundreds or thousands of mutations up and down the DNA. The things we're seeing today aren't normal. Illnesses that weren't epidemic before are now epidemic. We have gone from food in its whole food form to food undergoing a scientific experiment. The havoc that it will cause will be across the entire spectrum of disease. What the problem was is I guess he said that they weren't able to process the food correctly and they would bloat up and die from it. They can put it on the market without telling the FDA or to consumers. It became clear that the FDA had been lying repeatedly since 1992. It's not just an agriculture issue, it's not just a food industry issue, it's an ever-living creature issue. And if we don't do anything within a decade, every single major crop with any significant market size is going to be genetically modified, and we're not going to know it. The world can get rid of it. The world should get rid of it. The sooner, the better. Now. We look at what they're eating and we take out the genetically modified foods and the industry foods and they all get better. It never doesn't work. I don't want to be a human lab rat. And I certainly don't want my two-year-old daughter to be a human lab rat. It's not about feeding the world. It's not about the blind will see and the lame shall walk. It's about chemical companies selling chemicals. What have I done to my children? And what has been done to them without my consent? Mm. We're going to have some fun tonight. Wow, I have been looking forward to this conference. I have not prepared anything to say. I'm just here to start talking and let's see where it goes. I love what my friend Tom Newmark said, the hubris, the arrogance. And I'll describe a scene for you that another friend of mine saw. In January 1999, San Francisco conference, biotech conference, Arthur Anderson consulting company Monsanto's consulting company, Enron's consulting company, they described to the audience how they had worked with Monsanto's executives. They asked them to describe their ideal future in 15 to 20 years. And the executives described a world in which 100% of all commercial seeds were genetically engineered and patented and sold along with Monsanto's associated chemicals. And Arthur Anderson worked backwards from that goal to create the strategy and tactics to achieve it. My friend said he was livid, shocked, overwhelmed. It was the most arrogant statement he had ever heard in his life until the afternoon. When another company passed around a white paper projecting a 95% takeover of all commercial seeds within five years, they were planning to replace nature. And it's not just seeds. They've released genetically modified mosquitoes in three countries. The U.S. may be next. They want to introduce genetically modified salmon, pigs, moths, everything. Humans? They do not 
respect nature. They do not respect biodiversity. They are driven to control, to profit, and at the same time to risk everything which is the basis of life itself. And that is their fiduciary responsibility to their stockholders. Consider terminator technology, engineering crops to produce sterile seeds, not yet commercialized, but planned to be. We know this because when it was developed, the brochures described it as a technology to target the 1.4 billion farmers on earth who save seeds because they're not driving the bottom line of the seed companies. Not Monsanto's, the largest seed company in the world, or the others. And so they're ready to take this rich diversity, which is the basis of security of our food supply, especially at a time of shifting climate, and they are willing to eliminate that biodiversity forcing farmers to only buy from the limited genetics in their catalogs to maximize profit. So they're going into the DNA with their small creative minds, with their absolute arrogance and disrespect for nature, for biodiversity, for the thousands of years of culture, for the millions of years of evolution, and figure how can we jerry-rig the system for more profit. They are releasing the products of this infant science into the entire ecosystem, knowing that they cannot recall the self-propagating genetic pollution from the gene pool. The genes already released today will outlast nuclear waste, assuming the species survive. And they're releasing it so that everyone who eats is exposed. So you would think that the companies that were risking the entire life of the planet would be highly conscientious and concerned and extremely ready to delay until all of their concerns are addressed. But we're not talking about Monsanto. Because Monsanto has, for 11 years running, been voted as the most hated corporation on earth. I mean, talk about the stiff competition, right? They outpaced Halliburton, BP, goes on. Blackwater. They, beat, they hired Blackwater. Birds of a feather. Monsanto's PCBs, a very toxic substance, are in the blood of polar bears. It's Monsanto's form of omnipresence. When they hired a consultant at Anniston, Alabama, where they were leaking on purpose the PCB discharge into the rivers and air, poisoning the people, killing the people. The consultant had the audacity to put a fish in the local stream. Within, mi within a minute, it lost its skin, floated to the top, spurted blood, and was dead. The response by the executive in Monsanto to all of the evidence like this was very simple. You can read it in the memo made public from a lawsuit. We cannot afford to lose one dollar of business. I talked to a former Monsanto scientist. He confided in me that three of his colleagues who were doing safety studies on bovine growth hormone, which is injected into cows to increase milk supply, they looked at the milk and found so much of a cancer-promoting hormone called IGF-1, these three Monsanto scientists refused to drink milk thereafter unless it was organic. One bought his own cow. 
Can you imagine working for a company where you won't touch the stuff and yet you know it's being fed to the children? The scientist also shared with me that rats that were being fed genetically modified corn had serious health damage. But instead of removing the corn from the market, they removed the study, rewrote it to hide the evidence. We have since caught them red-handed doing that over and over and over again. And now I'm going to tell you a story which I've hardly shared with anyone. And it starts with that same Monsanto scientist, the former Monsanto scientist, who described the rat study. And he said to me, they're feeding the rats just a small percentage of their diet as genetically engineered corn. Probably 33% if it's their tradition. But he was aware that in South Africa, the staple eaten three times a day, 70% of the caloric intake was corn. So they were feeding rats less than half the amount that humans were eating, feeding them for 90 days, and the rats were showing problems. So they hid the evidence. I was with a veterinarian in the Midwest. You can see him in the telling me, him telling me the story in Genetic Roulette. I'll share it with you now. He had a client. And the client was South African. And he had a dairy and pigs. So he was feeding the dairy cows and the pigs genetically engineered corn. Now corn is genetically engineered for one of the two major traits of GMOs. And there's the Roundup Ready crops. Roundup Ready. Monsanto found bacteria growing in a chemical waste dump near their factory, not dying in the presence of Roundup. So they figured, great, let's put it in the food supply. Because Roundup normally kills bacteria, and for some reason the bacteria was invincible to Roundup, so they took the gene out of the bacterium, forced it into crops, so now they can spray the fields with Roundup. The fields of the genetically engineered crops don't die, just the other plant biodiversity gets killed. And we'll talk about some of the other things that can get killed or promoted in a few minutes. So the plants drink the Roundup and store a lot of it in the food portion. That's one of the problems. The other is the Bt toxin produced by corn. Bt, Bacillus thuringiensis, comes from bacteria in the soil. If you gather up the bacteria and spores and spray it on plants, it kills certain insects, breaks open the stomach of those insects, pokes holes in the cells, causing leakage and death. It's used in its natural form by foresters, by organic farmers, but it biodegrades, it washes off. But Monsanto puts Bt toxin genes from that bacteria into corn plants and cotton plants and allows the plants to do the killing at concentrations of the toxin thousands of times greater than the natural spray and it doesn't biodegrade and it doesn't wash off it's encapsulated in every cell so is it alarming to you that bt toxin is in your food well not if you believe monsanto because they say, don't worry your little heads about Bt toxin. Because Bt toxin is destroyed during digestion in mammals. And even if it weren't, it has no interaction with human cells until this year. When they took Monsanto's Bt toxin from their corn and exposed it to human cells, and the Journal of Applied Toxicology pointed out a little oversight. It pokes holes in human cells and causes leakage. But it's destroyed during digestion until last year's study in Canada. 
where they found Bt toxin in the blood of 93% of pregnant women tested and 80% of their unborn fetuses. And the blood-brain barrier is not well developed, so they may have Bt on the brain. So we have a situation where Bt toxin is drilling holes in human cells, which is in our food supply, it's in our blood, it's in our babies. Now, Bt toxin shouldn't survive for so long in the blood. It should be washed out fairly quickly. So the authors of the study in Canada said, how come 93% of pregnant women and two-thirds of non-pregnant women have Bt in their blood? They've got to have some form of constant feeding of Bt, and this is not Mexico. We don't feed on corn tortillas. This is not South Africa where people eat BT corn every day, three times a day. So they figured maybe that's because they're eating the milk and meat of animals that do eat BT corn every day. And the protein is not only surviving the digestive process of the cattle and the pigs, but that same protein is surviving the digestive process in humans and ending up in the bloodstream and in the babies. But I think there is a more plausible explanation which is very high on the yuck factor. The only human feeding study ever published showed that part of the gene inserted into soybeans to make the soybeans round up ready transferred into the DNA of bacteria living inside our intestines along with the promoter, which is the on switch. And that the bacteria that contained the Roundup Ready gene and promoter was not killable with Roundup, suggesting that the gene was continuing to function inside the gut bacteria, producing its protein over and over again. And that protein has properties of a known allergen, a dust mite allergen. So if you're allergic to dust, you might be allergic to Roundup Ready soybeans. And if you've eaten GM soybeans and the genes transferred to your gut bacteria, you may be continuously triggered by that allergic toxin. But they stopped the research. The UK government had sponsored that research. They had already f arranged for a scientist years ago to be fired when he discovered that GMOs were significantly dangerous. They gagged him with threats of a lawsuit through his institute that had been his employer for 35 years, attacked him, leaked documents, showed how the ministers had met to figure out how to trash this man's reputation until the UK parliament stepped in, lifted the gag order, and all hell broke loose in the media because here was a pro-GM scientist, the top scientist in the world in his field, saying that he would not eat GMOs and doesn't think the human population be, should be treated as guinea pigs, knowing what he knew about the massive damage to his rats in just 10 days. So the UK government did not follow up on this research showing genes transfer, so they never tested to see if the Bt toxin gene inserted into corn and eaten in corn chips transferred into the DNA of bacteria living inside our intestines, converting it into living pesticide factories. And I think that is why 93% of pregnant women have Bt toxin in their blood, because it's being produced inside of us, which might explain the 40% increase in inflammatory bowel disease in the United States since GMOs are introduced. Or ulcerative colitis, or Crohn's disease. Maybe the destruction of the villa on the walls of the intestines by Bt toxin is promoting gluten intolerance. But it goes on. If the Bt is drilling holes in the guts of our intestines, it's causing leaky gut, and many doctors believe that that's related to food allergies, autoimmune disease, inflammation, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, cancer, autism, etc. And these are the kind of things on the rise in the U.S. population. So this 
South African farmer was feeding BT corn to his pigs and his cows. And they were miserable. Horrible, horrible health problems. Rheumatoid arthritis problems, milk production problems, cannibalism, the pigs were biting the tails and ears off each other. Some would wander around like they had Alzheimer's, unable to find the feed and they would die. Diarrhea, list goes on. The veterinarian had instructed or advised the farmer in South Africa to never feed his animals GMOs again. So he planted some non-GM corn and soon after feeding the animals the corn, all the problems disappeared. Milk production soared. Medicine use dropped. He was absolutely flying high until he ran out. And he could only get GM corn from the field, so he got that. All the problems returned until he got non-GM corn that he grew himself enough to last the whole year. And then the problems went away. But that was the situation for his animals. He had workers on the farm eating only the corn that was being fed to the animals. So while the animals were eating genetically modified corn, of his 60 or 50 to 60 farm workers, one or two would die every month. He said, he would be speaking to someone and the eyes would not track. They'd move in different directions. And he knew that that person would be dead within one or two days. He had no idea why. He had no idea why he had to put 20% more workers on the farm just to cover those that were sick all the time with flu-like symptoms, severe headaches, colds, gastrointestinal distress, inflammation. Had no idea, but he kind of figured it out when the pigs and cows got better because the humans got better. And when he switched to GM corn, the humans got worse. And when he switched back to non-GM corn, the humans got better. These workers on a South African farm, eating just the GM corn from the farm, so it's 100%. They don't have the benefit of the store-bought GMOs, which is a combination of GM and non-GM. It's pure GM when it's from, the, from their own farm. They were eating more GM food than anyone in the world. So they were the guinea pigs, and they were dying. So this is what the former Monsanto scientist was concerned about when he saw the rats damaged so significantly from a small amount of Monsanto's corn. He was deeply concerned about the Africans and for good reason. But we don't have to be exposing ourselves to quite so much genetically engineered foods in order to have negative implications, especially if the genes are transferring into our gut bacteria, colonizing it, changing the gut bacteria balance, poking holes in our intestinal walls, etc. As I've been traveling around the world speaking, I've talked to many medical conferences and in the United States, I typically ask the audience to rate themselves from 1 to 100 how vigilant they've been at avoiding GMOs. And I say 1 is low vigilance, 100 is very vigilant. Most people are low vigilance, 1 to 20. How many are 1 to 20, 20 to 40, etc.? Most audiences start out low vigilance, 1 to 20. In fact, on the average, the average American on a scale of 1 to 20 is about minus 7 because they don't even know what a GMO is. They don't think they've ever eaten a GMO in their life. Then I describe thousands of sick, sterile, and dead livestock, 
damage to virtually every organ and every system studied. I show pictures of rat testicles before and after, pink before, blue after being fed genetically modified soy. Pictures of the liver, how it completely changes in its structure and becomes gnarly. I describe the mechanism of BT. I describe the dangers of Roundup and its fact that it can destroy the hormone balance and interrupt estrogen and testosterone production and lead to cancer and birth defects and Parkinson's, according to the studies. And how rodents fed Roundup-ready soybeans had changes not only in their testicles, but in the young sperm cells, in the uterus, in the ovaries, in the way the DNA functioned in the embryo offspring. When mother rats were fed genetically modified soy starting before they got pregnant, more than half of their babies died within three weeks compared to a 10% death rate among controls. The babies were also smaller and could not reproduce. Hamsters fed GM soy for three generations. Most lost the ability to have babies. Some had hair growing in their mouths. Mice fed Roundup Ready corn, which was also BT, had smaller babies and fewer babies. And I go on and on, I describe the documented health risks of genetically engineered foods and how it would be very difficult to even discover if there's a problem because no one is looking. And how an epidemic in the 1980s, which was covered up by the FDA, but actually linked to a genetically modified food supplement, L-tryptophan, killed 100 Americans, caused five to 10,000 to fall sick, and it was almost missed as an epidemic. Even after four years, it was almost missed. Even though the symptoms were screaming to be discovered because it was new symptoms, acute symptoms, that came on quickly. The three needed characteristics to show that something is new and, and identifiable. And I describe how multiple chronic illnesses in the United States nearly doubled in the first nine years since GMOs were introduced, and food-related illnesses doubled, and food allergies doubled. And I describe all the evidence and the way doctors who discover problems are fired, stripped of responsibilities, forced out, gagged, and threatened, and how industry conducts tobacco science and hides the evidence. And then I say in a sweet tone, now rate yourself how vigilant you'll be next week at avoiding genetically modified foods. <laughs> how many will be one to 20? Low vigilance, raise your hand. No hands go up. Funny. 20 to 40, no hands. 40 to 60, not usually. In a group of 250 physicians where most was one, were 1 to 20 at the beginning, all but one were 80 to 100 at the end willing to change their diets on the spot. In that particular group, I had 30 minutes on stage, so the pre-test and post-test post interval was 26 minutes. In 26 minutes, these professionals were ready to give up foods that they had grown up with. And probably more significantly, on a second pre-test and post-test post question, they also shifted from 1 to 20 to 80 to 100 with the question at the end, how active do you plan to be at educating patients and prescribing non-GMO diets? And we got swamped at the table for non-GMO shopping guides and patient education materials and audios and videos. And it happens everywhere we go. In fact, in the bonus DVD in Genetic Roulette, The Gamble of Our Lives, is a 42-minute talk I gave to Andrew Weil's Integrative Medicine Conference in San Francisco last year with close to 900 professionals, and they too shifted their hands so that the most popular category was 80 to 100 at the end. So we have thousands and thousands of physicians prescribing non-GMO diets. In fact, I visited the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, an organization that is like the Sherlock Holmes detectives looking for changes in human sickness and the causes. So they were the first organization, the medical organization, to identify and acknowledge Gulf War syndrome, food allergies, chemical sensitivity, and more than a dozen others. So I spoke at their conferences for four years in a row, and they decided to do their own investigation 
And at the end of the investigation, they said, every doctor should prescribe non-GMO diets to every patient. Now, I went to the conference after they had released their policy with a video camera. Now, at this point in my life, this was 2009, I had really embedded myself with scientists, independent scientists, to be their translator, to take their concerns, their fears, their findings, and make it available to the rest of the world. But as scientists, I don't know if you know scientists, they're kind of like cautious. They don't say, this causes this. They say, suggests that, appears that, converging lines of evidence demonstrate. So I was true to form, representing that level of caution. GMOs may do this. It appears this, to not only appease the scientists who I was representing, but also making friends with my inner attorney. But when I went to the American Academy of Environmental Medicine conference and interviewed the doctors, they spoke differently. One said, GMOs cause inflammation. Inflammation is the basis of most diseases. An allergist said, the allergic patients that I treat, they'll stay, they have to stay away from GMOs because they'll react to them and they'll tell you that. I tell them, GM soy is so dangerous, don't eat it unless it's organic. Emily Linder, who you saw in the trailer, said to me, and that was the interview in 2009, I said, she said, everyone gets better, it never doesn't work. I went like, what? Can you say that again? And she did, and I said, so what percentage of your patients get better when you remove GMO? She says, 100%. I said, how many patients have you treated? 5,000. I said, can I come to your office with a camera and a crew and videotape some of your patients? So for another film that's still being produced, we went to her office and someone said, yeah, got on the new diet. Beforehand, I was taking six pills a day for irritable bowel syndrome. A, week, a month later, no more pills. Another person, irritable bowel, gone in a week and a half. Another one, I talked to her 25 days into the diet. She said, after three days, colitis, which she had for 30 years, was gone. Skin condition, clearing up. Lost 10 pounds. Foggy brain, asthma, migraines, and from unsolicited comments to our office all the time, Restless leg syndrome, fertility problems, allergies, on and on. So I asked the patients, how do you avoid GMOs? And they said, well, first of all, we buy all organic. And I went, oh, damn. There's no labels. You got to have a strategy to avoid it. And buying organic is certainly a terrific strategy but then you get all the benefits of organic. So good for them, but not good for me as an investigator. I said, what else do you do? And then they said, well, we avoid where possible processed foods. And I went, oh, no. Because processed foods have all these nasty things in them. And some would have prescriptions to remove gluten and dairy. And I went, forget it. I can't deal with this. Too many cofactors. But on the same trip, we interviewed veterinarians and farmers who switched their animals from GM soy and corn to non-GM soy and corn and they weren't feeding them organic. They didn't have gluten-free pigs. There were no cofactors. But over the last two years we have heard Danish farmer switched his pigs from GM soy to non-GM soy he had massive problems with diarrhea that was often fatal. Two days later, diarrhea was gone. Now think about it. Pigs, diarrhea. Humans, irritable bowel. 
American Academy of Environmental Medicine, one of the categories they said in the laboratory animals, gastrointestinal disorders. Talk to a veterinarian for pets. He's written 40 books, has a syndicated column for 25 to 30 million called The Animal Doctor, Michael Fox. He said when GMOs came on the scene, he had, was flooded with letters from pet owners, diarrhea, as well as inflammatory bowel, itching, allergies. He says, get rid of the GM soy and corn. The problems went away. So we have an interesting thing. I'll summarize. The American Academy of Environmental Medicine said, the animals fed GMOs have reproductive disorders, immune system problems, and gastrointestinal problems, as well as organ damage, accelerated aging, and insulin and cholesterol dysfunction. The humans who got rid of GMOs got improvements in same categories. The livestock, same categories. The pets, same categories. And the same categories have been on the rise as disease rates in the US population since GMOs were introduced in 1996. And the theoretical understanding of what GMOs could do to us, drill holes in our guts, change our reproductive capacity, these are things that make sense now, the same categories. Now, I'm going to share with you some good news. So if you leave now, you're going to be really depressed. <laughs> but I want to share with you, because some of you are visual learners. And so I want to show you some of this stuff before I give you the good news. Soy, corn, cotton, and canola, sugar from sugar beets, alfalfa, nut sprouts, Hawaiian papaya, zucchini, and crookneck squash, those are the nine GM food crops. This is Dr. Arpad Pustai. He was the one that discovered the problems, who was fired after 35 years and silenced with threats of a lawsuit. And here's a picture of the intestinal walls in the rats that were fed his supposedly harmless genetically modified potatoes after 10 days. Here's the stomach lining. I had a pediatrician from San Francisco say when she looked at these slides in my book, Genetic Roulette, she said to herself, uh-oh, we've got a problem, because she was seeing this in her children. Failure to thrive, inability to digest or gain weight, allergic to everything. Skin rashes on thousands of Indian farm workers picking BT cotton. They allow animals to graze on the cotton plants after harvest. Thousands died. I visited this village. They had allowed their buffalo to graze on cotton plants for eight years without problem. They grazed on BT cotton plants for a single day. And all 13 were dead within three or four days. Just one of many stories. Autism, the parallels are crazy. The gut bacteria, the gastrointestinal disorders, the leaky gut, the behavior problems, all seen so tightly that one scientist, Don Huber, was talking in Germany last year and described the behavioral, physiological, and neurological changes in the animals, both livestock and laboratory animals fed GMOs, and an autism expert came up to him and said, this is exactly what's happening in autistic children. And on the film, you will hear from autistic parents about some of the amazing improvements when they took their autistic sons off of GMOs. Here's the picture of the innards that are discolored on the right from the GM-fed cows. And I've been told this by butchers. There's a stench that's in the GM-fed that's not in the non-GM because the gut bacteria is all different. And it's discolored organs. And if you pull the intestines out, they shred, they're paper thin, they break. So they don't make sausage casings in the United States, they import them from New Zealand now. Here's the pig stomachs on the right that are fed GM, irritated, inflamed, more ulcers. In fact, the Danish pig farmer that took his pigs off of GM soy, 
He had 36 deaths by ulcers and bloat in the two previous years, none in the year since he had switched. Here's that gnarly picture of the liver on the right of animals, rats fed GM soy. Testicles changed from pink to blue. I like to let that one sink in a bit. Size of the rats, considerably different when the parents were fed GM soy. Now, I'm going to show you something about Roundup, which we haven't discussed. If you look at this slide, that's iron, manganese, and zinc. And you can see the uptake into a crop after the crop has been sprayed with Roundup is quite a bit less, and the translocation or movement of that through the plant is almost non-existent. Roundup was originally patented as a broad-spectrum chelator, meaning that it hugs nutrients and doesn't let them go. When the way that it kills plants is not just direct death, it's perfect storm kind of stuff. It's diabolical. It deprives the plant of nutrients. Those trace minerals are needed for basic functioning. Without it, the plants are defenseless. Roundup promotes pathogens in the soil which overtake the plant. So all of these pathogens are on the rise in the soil in the United States because of the use of Roundup, more than 40 plant diseases. And you'll see on the upper right, on the left petri dish, fuzziness, fungus, fusarium, 500% increase in the land sprayed with Roundup. Fusarium can create mycotoxins, which through history have been linked to outbreaks of serious diseases. You can see on the right the yellowing of plants. Glyphosate was sprayed there the year before but not on the left. It's more obvious here where the back field was sprayed with Roundup. Glyphosate is Roundup's active ingredient. And the front here, the sprayer didn't get to, was too close to the pole. That's what it would have looked like in the back had Roundup not been sprayed. You can see the two fields very clearly. GMOs plus glyphosate or Roundup and not. After 10 years, the wheat on the right looks like that when the field was sprayed for 10 years compared to the left after one year. Now, there's stillborn calves from manganese deficiency. The animals are having manganese deficiency. There's nearly a universal deficiency of manganese among animals, livestock in the U.S., as well as some other minerals. Why is that? Because the animal's primary diet is Roundup-ready crops, and the Roundup-ready crops are deprived of nutrients. So the crops are weak and sick, and the animals are weak and sick. And we eat both, and we eat the Roundup, which can then chelate or hug the nutrients inside of us, depriving us and leaving us defenseless. Now, botulism is on the rise in the dairy population, it's also more in the human population. And Roundup kills bacteria in the gut of a cow which controls the, the botulism bacteria. And with glyphosate, the controlling bacteria is almost non-existent and botulism takes off. So if you look inside the stomach on the right, chronic botulism, because the animals have been eating Roundup-ready crops, changing the gut bacteria, according to the scientists. And now there's a lot of abortions in livestock. Now the abortions might be, or miscarriages, as they call it spontaneous abortions in livestock. It may be because of Roundup's changes in the hormone structure. It could be because it chelates important nutrients. Or it could be because of this organism on the left. A new organism found recently by a team of scientists in the aborted fetal tissue in farms where lots and lots of livestock were losing their fetuses. And they found that this organism was in high concentrations of feed treated with Roundup. And they found that this organism, when exposed to a pregnant chicken, would kill the embryo in 48 hours. 
So they are investigating. And Don Huber, one of the investigators, had 40 years in the military, in the intelligence services that consult and advise the government how to protect against the outbreak of diseases, both natural and man-made. He was an expert at bioterrorism. And he wrote a letter to Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack, the former governor of Iowa, and named the Biotech Governor of the Year. And asked and advised Secretary of Agriculture on January 17th last year about this new organism. And he said, in layman's terms, it should be treated as an emergency. And he urged him not to approve Roundup Ready Alfalfa, which would increase the use of Roundup dramatically and might exacerbate the abortions in mammals and maybe humans. And he was ignored. And the letter was leaked onto the internet, which is why I can tell you about this. Here's more pictures of this organism. Now, it's interesting that when animals are given a choice, they sometimes figure it out. This bag on the right, non-GM corn, was left in a work area. The guy wanted to try a test because he read in my book, Seeds of Deception, how so many varieties of animals avoid GMOs when given a choice. So he was going to bring it out in the winter time to feed to the squirrels and compare the right one to the left one, which was the GM corn. But when he came up to the bags, the mice had done the experiment for him and ate all the non-GM corn and none of the GM corn. So it's our job to get humans up to the level of animals. So now I will tell you the good news. I think you've had enough bad news for the night. In fact, you've got probably some bad news coming tomorrow. <laughs> I think I'll give you a breather. You can get to sleep tonight. I showed you the picture of Dr. Arpad Pustai, the guy whose rats had messed up guts. They also had partial atrophy of the liver, smaller brains, livers, and testicles, and damaged immune system in 10 days. Now, when his, that, remember that conference a long time ago at the beginning of my talk when you were still eating GMOs? Remember that San Francisco conference when they were expecting and projecting a 95% takeover of all commercial seeds within five years by 2004? And they were on track to do it, to replace nature, to own all the genes and to manipulate them and for the bottom line and profit, risk every living being for all future generations. Well, three weeks later, the gag order was lifted on Dr. Arpad Pustai. 159 column feet of articles were written in Europe within a single week. 700 articles within a month. And 10 weeks later, the biotech agenda was derailed. Unilever, yes. All right, we're starting to breathe a little. Starting to breathe a little. We're starting to see a little bit of light. Unilever, Britain's largest food manufacturer, raised its hand and said, no more GMOs in Europe. Within a day, Nestle said, no more GMOs in Europe. Within a week, virtually everyone else said the same thing, not because of government intervention, but because people didn't want to eat GMOs. So the same motivation that put GMOs on the market, greed and profit, took them off the market in Europe. But not in the United States, where Project Censor described the events of Dr. Pustai as one of the 10 most underreported events of the year. And that's why Europeans are more concerned about GMOs, because they know about them. But this is a very interesting model. From predicting a 95% takeover of all commercial seeds in the world in five years, to being driven off a continent in 10 weeks just because of media that covered it. Bovine growth hormone linked to cancer. The milk has more IGF-1, which promotes cancer, 
more pus, more antibiotics, more bovine growth hormone. It's banned in Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Canada. And now it's banned in Walmart's milk, Starbucks, Yoplait, Dannon, most American dairies. Yes. Because our coalition informed consumers. It wasn't 10 weeks. We didn't have major media on our side. But we had enough so that parents realized they're not going to put their kids into the cage with the guinea pigs. And so we can create a tipping point in the US against a GM product. We've seen how all GMOs were tipped in Europe. So now we think, what's it going to take? What's it going to take? And this is what Harrison was pointing out before. The incredible mathematics of activism, the incredible mathematics of revolutions are amazing. It is not an election. We don't need 51% of Americans avoiding GMOs so that the craft product manager says, you know, we've lost half of our market share. I think it's time to change. If they see any drop in market share that they can link to anti-GMO sentiment growing in the United States, that becomes a food industry sell signal and it's gone. So as little as 5% of Americans, 15 million Americans, that's only 5.6 million households avoiding GMOs and we will see a kind of tipping point in the United States and it's already underway. It is starting to happen. As we educate people about the health dangers, when people say, well, how are you going to convince someone to avoid GMOs? Well, first of all, we don't have to convince the couch potato junk food eating American who hasn't figured out that food relates to health. He will never know that he's eating a GMO. He'll never know we got rid of it for him. Because we don't need the average American. We need the receptive American. If we're going for 5%, 15 million, we can go to the 28 million Americans that buy organic on a regular basis. Or the parents of young kids that won't change their own diet for themselves, but they will for their kids. Or the sick people who are desperate. Or the doctors who are enlightened. Or the religious people that think GMO means God move over. These, are, these people are ready, they're ripe, they're low-hanging non-GMO fruit. And all we need to do is to well, what are you going to tell them? How are you going to get them to change the diet? This question does not come up around this time in the lecture. Because by now, usually, I ask the audience to rate themselves and I say, see, this is how we do it. We tell the truth. And I ask the audience, as I did before, rate yourself how active you'll be now at getting the word out because mostly you were 1 to 20 and getting the word out before and most people are now 80 to 100 or 60 to 100. And I say, see, the same information that changed your diet makes the message go viral. So we have the information. We've packaged it as books for the right brain book, the left brain book, the, the DVD for the visual learner, the DVD for the parent, the audio for the iPad owner. We have the materials, the blogs, the PowerPoints, the speaker training, the tipping point network of activists around the country. It's just a, ma a matter of marching out the same proven behavior changing message to enough people and we'll reclaim a non-GMO food supply. So even better news, it's not theoretical. In the past three years, non-GMO products have been one of the fastest growing la label claims in America for, n for goods sold in the normal s supermarkets and grocery stores. We've seen an upsurge of thousands of people now, agitated and concerned, and getting out there and telling people, millions of people who are seeking non-GMO products, thousands and thousands of doctors, unprecedented press coverage, and this general concern about GMOs has driven people to demand labeling. So 19 different states have introduced bills to get labeling in their states. None have gotten passed. Yes, that's good news, okay. Let's hear for Connecticut and Vermont and Washington and California. And none of these have gotten yet past Monsanto's influence peddling and, and lobbying and threats. But in California, there's a ballot initiative. Prop 37 will demand mandatory labeling. So there is an opportunity now that is unprecedented in human history. 
Because think about it, if you're a craft food manager, sorry, just a theoretical concept. If you're a craft food manager, and you know that 53% of Americans say they would avoid GMOs if labeled, and labeling comes to pass, what are you gonna do? We've heard already that many companies are ready to eliminate GMOs rather than admit they use them. I certainly think that labeling is gonna change the playing field. I certainly believe it's gonna happen. I believe we're gonna pass this thing, but I'm not sitting back. Now, when we think about the right to know Prop 37, I wanna put it in perspective. And you have some perspective now based on this talk we've shared together in terms of life on Earth, started brilliantly by Tom Newmark, the entire evolution of the species being replaced. So all people who eat, and that's most of us, all living beings that exist outdoors to interact with the ecosystem, that's most of us, all future generations, as long as gene pools exist, and that's our great-great-grandchildren, and all the animals and bugs and gut bacteria, all of that is at risk. All of that, the karma of all living beings and all future generations is tied up with what happens right here. The entire world has been bullied by the United States, bludgeoned if you read WikiLeaks, if you read the State Department oh, statements about GMOs, the way USAID and the, and the Trade Office, they all push GMOs as if they're Monsanto's best friend, as if. If we can change the political climate in Washington about GMOs by, say, eliminating them in the food of the food supply and making them very popular among Americans, I think that'll change the political climate around the world. If we can get votes here to pass Prop 37, if companies remove GMOs for California, they're gonna do it for the rest of the country. This is the battleground. It is amazing how epic this is. No one in history has faced a foe that had such capacity of harm, all living beings, all future generations. So similarly, the opportunity for good in this generation, in this auditorium, among the people listening. None of your ancestors ever had the opportunity to do such good in this world as to protect all living beings for all future generations by saying no to this. And it is so simple. It is so simple because 91% of Americans say we have the right to choose and have wanted GMOs labeled for years. 49 other countries have labels. 40% of the world's population enjoy labels. It is a logical thing that people have a choice. However, the biotech industry is gathering the dark winds. I can hear the, 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 the theme song to Darth Vader going on in the background. And they're, they're starting their campaign. They've got $25 million now. They're probably gonna double or triple that or quadruple that. And they're already saying, they're already trying to confuse us by saying that the measure is confusing. They're spent more money than they'll ever spend on labels, on labeling their product, telling us that labeling is too expensive. Their logic is impeccably dull self-contradictory, ridiculous, but they're professionals. They have been able to take a world and get it to vote against its best self-interest, to have farmers invest in products that work against farming. They are brilliant, at, they are far greater at lying and deceiving than they ever be at making good crops. So we need to get organized. Now we don't have a hundred million dollars, we have $1.95, but what we have 
is us. How many people here have a Facebook page? How many have an email address book? How many know anyone else? <laughs> We're all networked. We're all networked. So what the Institute for Responsible Technology and our Food Policy Fund have done is to create materials that you can click and send, loan, share, give away, talk about. You can go to responsibletechnology.org, steal, share. You can go and get some materials in the booth in the back, order a lending library to be sent directly to you. You can show the film, Genetic Roulette. It'll be shipped next week. Coincidentally, no, in time for the campaign. You can look up labelgmos.org and get in touch with your local volunteers. In fact, before we end, and we'll do this in a few minutes, we'll turn up the lights so that local volunteers can stand up and be recognized and you can find them afterwards and get connected with them. And if you don't see someone from your area, please go to Label GMOs. Now, I want to urge you in this case, urge you in a very good way. The opportunity is amazing. All living beings, all future generations, and in eight weeks, people start voting. This is the time. And my experience is, knowing that we're connected so deeply on the gross and on the subtle, I can tell you from personal experience, Working on this issue is a breeze. It's a never-ending breeze, pushing the sail from behind with incredible grace. Because what I have is the support of all living beings and all future generations. And all of us working on this feel the same thing. This is something not to be missed. This is something not to let slip away. This is an opportunity not just to protect the world. This is a spiritual opportunity. This is a holy opportunity. This is a necessity. This is a duty. This is a privilege. And this is the time. People in Rhode Island don't have this opportunity. People in Taiwan don't. It's California. It's now. So it is an amazing place to be. We're seeing history, but more than history being made here. We're seeing life protected. So I am so looking forward to November 7th, the day after the election day, and to look ahead at a horizon of a non-GMO food supply for ourselves and our future generations. Thank you very much. We have a microphone for questions. Now, we don't have more than even 15. We have 12 minutes for questions. So I would like to ask you to make your questions brief. And if you have a comment, to really make it brief, because I want to get to a lot of questions, because there's a lot of angles to GMOs. And I'm sure some of you have particular questions that I've never heard before. I'm looking forward to it. So the microphone is over here. So if you have a question, find the man with the microphone. While we're waiting, those people who are involved in the Label GMOs grassroots activism and have groups in their area, please stand up and be recognized and appreciated for the work that you're doing. So are there any leaders here from Label GMOs? Raise your hand. Leaders? Okay, so what we're going to do is if you want to join, go to labelgmos.org, but we'll also take your names and information and send it on at the booth back there where we have books and DVDs and CDs because we don't want to lose this opportunity. And also we have a newsletter called Spilling the Beans. We normally circulate a sign-up sheet for that. Maybe someone can put together a sign up sheet for name and email for us and we'll have that also available at our booth so we can make it easy for you. It's there already, great. So now we can take questions. There seems to be high fructose corn syrup in just about everything. Is that GMO? 
High fructose corn syrup grown or so made in the United States is genetically engineered. Now, it won't have the DNA or the protein, so there's no BT toxin left. There's no capacity for gene transfer. But the process of genetic engineering causes massive collateral damage in the plant DNA. So Monsanto's BT corn, for example, has 43 vastly different amounts of proteins, 43 proteins. So there's a new allergen. There's changes in the size of proteins, really significant damage. And so the composition is different. And so there's still risk, even though there's no DNA or protein. I'm your old friend, Dr. Gordon. I'm just 77 years of age, and that talk tonight was incredible. But I'm Dr. Gordon, and you need to know that I can make it stronger than you said it. The inflammation that you're talking about from that leaky gut is the major cause of all degenerative disease, cancer, and aging, and diabetes. And if we get people off of the foods they're sensitive to, they will age much slower. I'm 77 and I've never been this young because I've known you for years and you changed my life. Thank you. Well, Dr. Gordon, I th did you see the trailer? Because you're in it. <laughs> I have this great shot of you talking about with like, you just have so much energy and so much like, who is this young guy? Thank you, thank you for that. Thank yes. you for coming. You're wonderful. I have a question. If you go to the health food store and you buy corn that's labeled organic corn that you want to take home to put in a, in a um, popper to make fresh corn, can you trust that that corn that says organic corn is organic corn? So first of all, if it's popcorn, there's no genetically engineered popcorn, whether it's organic or not. It hasn't been commercialized and it doesn't cross-pollinate. Organic products are not allowed to intentionally use GMOs. Sometimes the Occasionally, the, you get a dumb pollen that can't read the sign, and it'll cross-pollinate. So sometimes there's tiny amounts of contamination in organic, and that will be even the case for products that are verified as non-GMO by the Non-GMO Project, a third-party verifier that has verified about 4,000 products, and they're on our shopping guide at nongmoshoppingguide.com. I'll show you that. Uh, here's the, um, sh the iPhone application, Shop No GMO, that's free, you can download. We have a pocket guide, we have some about the, uh, the pocket guide has the brands, the actual electronic stuff has the actual products from the brands, and here's the website itself divided into categories. So organic is one of our recommendations to avoid GMOs, but our products in the guide have to be third party verified as non-GMO, which does require testing, and organic doesn't require testing. But even if it does require testing, it's not gonna guarantee 100% GMO free because there may be tiny levels of contamination if it contains the at-risk ingredients like soy or corn derivatives. Next. Uh, fantastic talk. Uh, how would you characterize the role of the FDA and the USDA, Food and Drug Administration and the U.S. Department of Agriculture in this whole uh, picture? <laughs> Michael Taylor, Monsanto's former attorney recruited to become the Deputy Commissioner of FDA for Policy in 1991. He was in charge of the FDA GMO policy. It said, we don't see any difference with GMOs, so companies like Monsanto that told us that PCBs, Agent Orange, and DDT were safe can determine if GMOs are safe on their own, never tell the FDA, and never tell consumers. Michael Taylor became Monsanto's vice president. He's now the U.S. food safety czar. Documents made public from a lawsuit seven years later showed that the overwhelming consensus among the scientists at the FDA were that GMOs were not only different but dangerous. They had urged their superiors to require long-term study. The USDA, on July 1st last year, wrote a letter to Scott's miracle Grow saying, we do not need to look at your genetically engineered Kentucky bluegrass because it does not fit into our regulatory framework. In other words, thousands of products don't need to look, be evaluated at all by the USDA or the EPA or the FDA or anyone in government because the USDA is part of that cabal 
which is saying, open door, no questions asked. They are not the friends of nature in this case. They are not the friends of humanity, of all living beings and all future generations. They are not our friends in this case. They are the enforcement wing of the biotech industry and it is shameful. And it is not something that we should take lightly but we don't have to feel heavy about it because they're not in charge. We are in charge. Next. Hi, um, thank you again for all you do. Um, I just would like to draw, uh, draw the connection between chemtrails and the GMOs. And I have heard that the, the Terminator seeds, that the GMO seeds are aluminum resistant. And that seems to be one of the components in the chemtrails. And I'm just wondering how, I've heard in, also in that like farmers in Hawaii saying they're having trouble growing their organic crops. Although my organic garden went gangbusters this year. So I'm just wondering if you could comment about the aluminum that's being deposited into our soil and how that's gonna affect things. I knew that question was coming. So ter I don't think terminator seeds are necessarily related to the aluminum. Those are two different traits, I think. I first heard about the aluminum resistant uh, patents from Michael Murphy's movie. And I haven't done any research to, I don't know if it's gonna be easy for anyone to find out why that's the case, but it could simply be that they are doing a patent grab. Any protein that they can characterize and understand its influence, they are patenting in the hopes that they can get it before anyone else and capitalize on it. So it might be related to chemtrails, completely unrelated, it might be totally innocent that they happen to have discovered the aluminum resistant protein and the, the gene that creates it and they have the patent for it. On the other hand, it may not be. I don't have any, any information that link GMOs with chemtrails and I'm open to receiving anything that someone comes up with, but uh, so I'm not gonna be able to help you expand that understanding. Next. Um, what is the relationship of uh, GMOs and blue corn products? Good question. Blue corn is not genetically engineered, but blue corn products may have non-blue corn contamination. So if you buy blue corn chips that are not organic or don't say non-GMO, they may contain genetically engineered components. And one blue corn uh, story is a farmer in Illinois was planting blue corn and farmers two to three miles away were complaining of blue kernels in their field. And we know that pollen can remain viable for up to 24 hours and in some weather conditions can fly theoretically 500 miles. So pollen doesn't have to be uh, reading the signs. They can just, it just goes out. It just goes out. Trader Joe's has a policy that none of their brand is genetically engineered. They haven't released their specific criteria, but they say specifically that they do random testing to verify the statements made by their suppliers. So they are. So my, my attitude is to Trader Joe's, thank you for being non-GMO. And I would also like to know your criteria. In fact, I encourage you to be part of the non-GMO project. So I heard some shuffling behind me. There's probably a guy over there. Um, so this means I'm going to sign off, but I want to sign off with a little statement here. And I don't know what I'm going to say, but I'll just start talking like I did earlier. I feel your enthusiasm. You know, this group is so global. I mean, I know some of you don't stop at this solar system. You think, <laughs> you think big. I mean, I, I like to think of the t-shirt, think huge, thinking big is so last century. And it is that we have huge problems. So we need huge thinkers. And what is brilliant about this group is so many people in the United States and in the world look to others as role models and aim about here. And they ask permission. They ask permission for empowerment and for thinking outside the box. And I, that might even be designed by the way our educational system is structured in the US after the Prussian system, which was et cetera, et cetera. Not going there, but where I'm going is this. 
the way that you breathe, the way that you stand, the, the way that you model life is a powerful contagion that is a way to antidote the basic epidemic of someone else is responsible. Someone else will take care of it. That's the epidemic which got us in this situation and it is the intense self-empowerment and self-knowledge that is the antidote. So I am honored, humbled, and thank and grateful to be with you, the models today. Thank you very much. Yeah.